lesson today comes from Luke chapter 6 verse 39 if you'll stand with me as we read that together he also told them this parable can a blind man lead a blind man will they not both fall into a pit a student is not above his teacher but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is the word of the Lord. A very eventful week we've had, an eclipse, a hurricane, huge flooding, schools back in session, people are arriving and people are leaving. It has been a very busy week, especially right here in Altus, a rodeo, all kinds of um, special events being planned for our Air Force base, a Air Force a show going to happen just uh, two weeks away from now. So just lots of things that are going on right here in Altus. And uh, as we come to this important point in our journey with the parables, a whole lot going on in the life of Jesus. He has been waiting. I often think of what it must have been like for Jesus to know he was Messiah, but to wait until he was 30 years of age to finally step on the stage and unleash all of the grace and goodness of God that he had pent up inside of him. I'm sure he did things, little glimpses along the way, but nobody really understood who he was, maybe except his mother and a few others. But now that he's on the ministry track, all kinds of things are happening, good things and bad things. A lot of bad things. A lot of people who are questioning who he is. A lot of people who don't want to hear what he has to say. A lot of people who out and out reject him. And even some who are ready to get rid of him. And he makes this important statement in the context of what's happening in his life. Parables are not just eternal truths. They are that. We can still learn 2,000 years later from what Jesus said in that context as he was dealing with what was happening in his life. But he's surrounded by people who don't believe him, who don't believe what he's saying, who don't accept that he's Messiah. Judaism has built up a great edifice of religious respectability, but the living faith is absent for the most part. And here Jesus is the very dynamo of God, the very fountainhead of life. And he's confronting Judaism head on. And most of them are not interested. We're not buying. Who do you think you are? Now tell me again, who was your rabbi that taught you? Where do you get your authority from? We're not interested in you, Jesus. In fact, most of the things you say are kind of irritating. We put out, we're annoyed. And so Jesus makes this bold judgment, if you will. Blind leading the blind. 
If a blind man leads another blind man, it's not going to be long and they're going to fall into a pit. And he's talking about the leadership especially that he's confronted with in Judaism. He has come to restore vitality to people's faith. He has come to correct some of the excesses and those things that are lacking in this important nation that God has revealed himself to. They have the revelation of God. They are the trustees of God's truth. And now God in person is standing among them. But they're saying, we're not interested. Who do you think you are? Where do you get your authority from? Who gives you the right to say the things that you're saying? How dare you call us hypocrites? How dare you judge us? And so Jesus goes on to say, you're quick to find fault with others. You're quick to see a little speck in somebody's life. While you're carrying a big old plank in your own eye. You can't even see the plank. Why don't you take the plank out and then you can look nicely, carefully, and take that little speck. If you've ever had a little speck of sawdust in your eye, it hurts. I mean, it shuts everything down. Don't let's make fun of a little speck. If it's in your eye, it really needs help. But can you see somebody in this illustration that is truly blind trying to help you? Somebody who really doesn't know God trying to lead you in a relationship with God? Somebody who is devoid of mercy and love, the very heart of God, trying to share God's mercy and love with others. This is what Jesus is dealing with. And he's taking us all the way back to God's purpose, the very heart of God. You see, right in the beginning, when God made us and put us in that idyllic garden, he would show up and visit with us every day. You know why? Because he wanted to be personally acquainted with us. He became the guide, the mentor, the advisor for Adam and Eve. If they had a problem, they couldn't wait for God to show up and they could talk about it. How do we handle this one? Or if they had a great success, I can't wait to share that with, with the Creator and tell Him what I did today. That's the kind of relationship He longs for with every one of us. No wonder Jesus had to teach His disciples to call him Father. That's who he was. He created us his children. He visited with us like parents visit with their kids at the end of the day. How was school? What did you enjoy? Do you have any homework? Are you hungry? Would you like to go and throw the ball? What's that? That's that personal involvement. God had that with his creation when he made us. But that got lost. That got tangled up. That all too soon became forgotten. In fact, if you read the story a little further down in Genesis, things become so bad that there's only one family left that is paying any attention to God. Only Noah had a real love and a trust in God. And so God says, judgment. I'm going to destroy the world. And Noah's got to build an ark. And when it's all ready and they're in the ark, God closes the door. And God causes those floodwaters to cause a deluge that nobody can escape. I mention that to say the very heart of God is a heart that wants to be personally acquainted with us, that wants to be in our lives, advising us, sharing the joys and sorrows of life. Somebody has said, why do we even bother to pray? God knows everything, so why do we have to tell him? Well, oops, somebody hurt his head, it sounds like. Okay. Well, I'm glad you asked that because you see, God is not just some <laughs> big data bank with information. God is a relational father. Which mother or father doesn't want a hug or a kiss from their kiddo? Which father or mother doesn't want to help their grandchild thrive? And if our God is anything like us, if we see any glimpse of God in us, then I want to tell you God is a thousand times more concerned about the details of your life. He wants to hear what is going on, your longings, your dreams. He wants to hear about your struggles. He wants to be your counselor. No wonder Jesus says the hairs on your head are numbered. The thoughts in your mind are known to God. Not a sparrow falls to the ground, but God knows it. And you with, Eugene Peterson says, a million sparrows. 
You see, God's concern is to be deeply involved and related to us. And yet Jesus is standing in the midst of the leaders of the day, and they are devoid of intimacy with God. There is a lack of love and mercy. There is a, an arrogance. There is a dismissive spirit to them. Get out of our face, Jesus. We're not interested. We're not buying. Who do you think you are? And so Jesus says, you know what's going on here? The blind. Leading the blind. We just sang a beautiful hymn. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. That's a song about hearing from God, being acquainted with God's purpose. The revelation of God coming to, to bear in your life and mine. I remember when I was a teenager boy, I knew the answers. And I wasn't very big on taking counsel from anyone. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And if I got into trouble, I was quick to, to come up with some kind of a lie to cover my tracks. I was full of myself. And when I got away with something, whether I had stolen something or lied and got away with it, I felt, mm, man, what a guy I am. Until the light of God penetrated. Until God showed me what a, what a shameful excuse of a son I was. Arrogant in my own eyes. In fact, the Bible speaks of that kind of attitude, doing what is right in your own eyes. And yet Jesus is surrounded by rabbis and Pharisees and Sadducees that are so elevated in their own estimation of themselves that they will not hear from God. God showed up with Adam and Eve and God showed up with Noah and God showed up with Abram and God showed up with Moses and now God shows up in person, in Jesus. And most of the people are so right in their own eyes that they're not interested. And he says, you know what's going on here? The blind leading the blind. The liars and the cheats and those who are wrapped up in themselves are leading the charge. And you know where they're headed for? A fall, a pit. It's tragic that those who should be guiding are themselves blind. So I pause today and I ask you and ask myself, who's guiding you? Who do you seek counsel from? Who sets the pace of your life and the direction? Where is true north for you and me? It's obvious that these Pharisees had come up with their own plan. And the Sadducees had. And he has God himself trying to visit and counsel. And they're saying, speak to the hand. And I'm afraid that many of us are caught up in the same. We have a society that is so strong, a culture that is so strong, that it tends to elevate our own importance. We have discounted the word of God. We have set the counsel of God aside. And we'll look elsewhere for the answers. Sometimes people will say, I've tried everything. I guess I better pray. Like God is a last desperate resource. My last resource is God. Folk, I think what Jesus is trying to say is, if I'll open your eyes, if you'll listen to me, if you'll let me be your mentor, I'll be your first resource. I'll be your trusted resource. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one really finds life or God except if you'll hear me and follow me. Then your eyes will be opened. And you know what the good news is? He won't just lead you and help you. He will help others through you. God's heart is to touch everyone, to help everyone, to heal everyone. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God died for the salvation of all. And when he gets you right, then through you he can help others get their lives right. So someone like Noah was able to save his family because he trusted God and allowed God to counsel him. And someone like Abram left his homeland and traveled with God and his family were blessed and through him the nations of the earth are still being blessed. You know why? Because he took God's counsel. Because he trusted that God was who God is and that he would do what he promised. And Moses delivered his people and raised up a nation who became the bearers of the truth of God, the revelation of God. And out of that nation came our Savior, Jesus. Because one man was willing to go to Egypt and face Pharaoh, God was able to do an amazing deliverance that is still touching lives today. And if we'll touch on each life that takes God seriously, 
God not only does something wonderful in them, but through them, He touches others. The Peters of this world, the Pauls of this world, the John Wesleys of this world. God does something beautiful in their lives because they trust Him. They seek His counsel. They let His word dwell richly in them. And then through them, God is able to bless others. And hear me this morning, church. God wants to do the same for you. He wants to open your blind eyes and mine. He wants to make sure that when we lead others, we are leading them down the road that leads to life. There's a lot of bad counsel out there today. I hear it all the time. I see it. We are inflamed with all kinds of vices. God help us. God deliver us. Help us to be a holy people that reflect Him beautifully. You know, there were some Pharisees who trusted Jesus and God did something beautiful in their lives. There were some rebel sons and rebel daughters who knelt at His feet and asked Him for forgiveness. And whether they were prostitutes or whether they were tax collectors or whether they were liars or cheats, God forgave them and made them beautiful masterpieces of His grace. God doesn't want our blindness to continue. God wants our eyes to be wide open. And like Adam and Eve, He wants to visit with us daily. He wants to be our best friend, our counselor, our guide, our mentor. That's who Jesus was. No wonder His 12 disciples turned the world upside down, short of Judas who betrayed Him. He invested Himself into them. He taught them. He showed them how to live. And after He left, they turned the world the right side up. And I tell you this morning, church, He wants to do the same with you and me. He wants to turn this upside down world the right side up. He wants to correct the errors. He wants to shine His light. He wants to share His love. He asks us to remove that big old plank so we can see clearly and help those who need our help. If there's a little speck in somebody's eye, may I be ready with my little handkerchief to dig that little puppy out and say, you'll be okay now. God wants to make you a blessing. Let Him. Let us pray. Forgive us, Lord, for being blind, for being arrogant, for being stubborn and hypocritical. You know us when we're at our worst. What a pain we can be. And there you were surrounded by folks who in their own eyes thought they were the best of the best, the cream of the crop, the most religious in the land, and yet so many of them were blind, were devoid of love and intimacy. Oh God, break out of our lives anything that is hindering you. Remove anything that's in the way. Take out our stony hearts and put in fleshly hearts. Wash us in your blood. Fill us with your spirit. Open our blind eyes that we may see, truly see. And help us to help all of those we meet along the way. Whatever their struggles are to pray, to serve, to encourage, to love, to give the way you showed us how. Make us your beautiful sons and daughters. Be our mentor. Be our guide. We pray it this morning in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen.